My name is uh, Daniel Taylor from Scan International, and I would like to thank you all for joining us today. Only a few months ago, some destinations, if you remember, were discussing the problems of what the so-called over-tourism. And suddenly, we have moved into total uncertainty, wondering when and how we will be able to restart a system that uh, has been completely shut down. So from, we've gone from white to black, from day to night, without half measures. And now it's time to start again, practically from scratch. As uh, events are evolving, it is plausible to think that there will be a before and an after. And this is not the first pandemic, nor the first catastrophe, nor even the first economic recession that this sector is going through. But this situation for its characteristics is actually got no precedent. But this crisis, crisis also opens a window of opportunities to rethink the tourism industry and rebuild it from a new vision, which is more aligned with the, the uh, challenges uh, of humanity, challenge, environmental, social, and even technological challenges. So maybe the proven resilience of uh, the tourism sector uh, will likely rise again, but we also need changes in the behavior of uh, governments, tourists, and uh, obviously business people in the sector. During the first months of this year, we have dedicated time evaluating the economic impact produced by the pandemic. We have discussed uh, many times on how services, hotels, uh, transportation will have to be adapted. And today um, is um, to share with us how uh, we should focus on the challenge of the of destinations. And this is the, um, the theme today. And um, so how destinations can and should work on repositioning plans so that uh, tourists perceive them as safe, uh, um, them as safe destination. Today, we have with us uh, Maribel Rodriguez. She is the senior vice president of the World Travel Tourism Council, responsible, responsible for the membership and commercial areas. She was the commercial executive uh, director and council members at Travel Lodge Hotels from uh, 2008 to 2014. And she also spent 11 years in the airline industry, managing the launch and operations of low-cost airlines such as Virgin Express, GoFly, EasyJet, and Ryanair. And we also have with us uh, Christopher Imsen, Director of Destination Management of the World Travel and Tourism Council, who is responsible for ensuring that the WTTC and its members have a positive impact on destinations which are facing opportunities and challenges related to the tourism growth. Um, Chris, from 2012 to 2019, was Deputy Regional Director for Europe of the World Tourist Organizations and was responsible for relations with the organization's European member states. So I would like to welcome both and um, would like to thank you for joining us. Thank you both. Thank you to Daniela. So, um, I would like you to talk about uh, WTTC, uh, its reaches, and uh, uh, the uh, objectives, uh, because God's have had uh, an important, uh, it's been a, a role. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you, all of the attendants from all over the world. Thank you for your invitation, and thank you for giving us an opportunity to explain who we are and what we do. We are an organism representing the private sector worldwide. We represent uh, chief executive officers of big companies all over the world. 30% of our members are in Asia, 30% in Europe, 30% in the area of uh, America, 10% all over the world. 
and our main objective has been to have one single voice on behalf of the private sector and to explain the challenges of our industry that moves so many uh, different things, creates uh, employment, and we have challenges on the long term, which is environmental challenges, and also our members are companies from the most disruptive ones to the most traditional ones. All of them are a part of the network of value and all of them must be together. Although outside this organization, they can compete, but within the organization, we are all together because we are facing really complicated times. Uh, all this situation has caused a big trouble and right now we are just surviving. For example, we have uh, executive committees, we have cruises, we have airports, all of them are really important. Destinations have gone from advertisement, from advertising to having direct relationship with the private sector. And as you can see, we have people from all over the world and from many different industries. With this crisis, our work now is very interesting. And this is basically what our organization you, is Marcel. all about. Now, we know that tourism is a very important economic engine and millions of people worldwide depend on it. Uh, we have discussed this uh, um, very often, and um, this is uh, one of the uh, subjects that we've been discussing when we join up. The impact of the pandemic has, had, uh, has caused a uh, great impact on the uh, tourist sector. So what data can you share with us about global tourism prior to the pandemic? and uh, obviously at the estimates. And so this is quite important because you are the organism that uh, concentrate this uh, information. On the one hand, uh, I can say that we have been measuring the impact of tourism over the countries for 30 years. Why are we doing this? Because it's the only way uh, to know what's going about, knowing what the sector means uh, for the, for the gross value and we we see that our sector has been growing over the economy we have been growing 3.5 percent so we have proved the importance that we have as an engine for the economy we are one out of 10 employments in the world belongs to our sector and one out of four new employments are related to travels and tourism. So it's 130 million jobs that we have created. So it is clear that we are bringing value and we should be listened. So what happens now when the crisis has come? First thing we find is this situation of constant loss of employment. We have carried some works to try to mitigate this problem, but to date, and if the situation does not change and without the involvement of the governments, 197 million uh, jobs will be lost all over the world. This is the situation that we are facing. The positive side is that we will keep on working because uh, there's a lot of resilience in this sector, as we will see. But this is the picture where we are right now. The scenario that you share obviously talk about tourism in the last nine years and the impact projections uh, is we hope will not reach the most negative scenario. Um, 
that would obviously be devastating not only for her tourist sector but for the economy in general because obviously what we got clear is that many of the governments uh, did not have very clear the tourism sector as uh, an economic um, engine and, and now they know that it is but uh, this is so important and it's important to uh, work together and put all our energy and uh, we have to see what we have to do uh, looking forward to the next few months which will be fundamental so what kind of measures uh, is uh, um, the WTTC recommending to help in the recovery and reactivation of the tourism and destination? Can we talk about, about a safe restart? Because this is so important, uh, confidence and uh, a safe restart. And this is the uh, subject today. We have worked relentlessly on our weekly meetings having a platform where everyone can share their best practices because right now we are here in order to cooperate basically uh, we find that we must have cooperation between the public and the private sector this is something that we must repeat and repeat and repeat once again we cannot stop we know that the virus is here we know that it's going to last for some time we are working on vaccines eventually there will be a vaccine but in the meantime we cannot wait because the companies will no longer be there when this is over if we stop so we have a before and after the vaccine scenario we will speak about the after the vaccine scenario because we will have different plans but obviously coordination is of the essence also front borders must be open quarantines are a penalty to everyone especially if it's only one section that is affected because it does not allow the movement of the money. It does not allow the movement of the people. So we must make sure that the affected areas are the only ones isolated, but we must have bubbles or corridors, safe corridors. Um, so we must get rid of the barriers, uh, provided that there's safety. It's not only barriers, physical barriers, but also trust, confidence, and we must work in order to get rid of those barriers. We must also take into account the experience of the client because we cannot put further barriers than the ones that he already has, but we must let, we must let him know, let the, the traveler know that everything is safe. So we must also implement protocols uh, regarding safety. Because Christopher has been very important for this. We have been leading this. Maybe it should have been the, the public sector, the one leading, but we found that we had to do it. We had to uh, implement which are the protocols which are necessary in order to travel from one point to the other. And we have been dealing with airlines, hotels, airports, destinations, in order to make these protocols that will ensure that we have a safe trip. And we must keep on working with the governments so that there are measures that will guarantee that the companies will still exist. Uh, we also are pushing so that the governments take into account the employment, the tax, and everything which is having an impact of on, on this sector. Uh, since this sector is a motor of the economy, we must make sure that this continues working. So this is a, a basic a sketch. I, I will give further information, but this is basic a sketch. The world has never joined, uh, come together to defeat a threat like COVID-19. But uh, as you said, and we always repeat in our Wednesday meetings, we need the, uh, a global response which is coordinated and especially uh, together with the science. And this is what has come through from the public in general, of the, po the uh, potential traveler. And uh, considering that uh, there aren't any unified national protocols, and we discussed it last week, it seems that uh, uh, it 
has been the private sectors and large corporations who have uh, taken the lead in designing uh, and, and uh, take this to uh, a discussion. So what role has the uh, World Travel and Tourism um, Council, the WTTC, um, what role has it played in this process? Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. I would like to thank you for this. And being from, from Norway, I will say that skull is something that we say in our country That's when right. we are toasting. So I really like the name of your company. So going back to your question, before the crisis, we had uh, a study analyzing the impact of different crises like natural disasters, uh, terrorist attacks, pandemics, and we found that the basis of any success, there's some common principles, which are we must learn from the past, we must learn from the good practices, we must avoid creating new proceedings which are unnecessary. We must implement either protocols or standards on a global uh, basis together with the public sector in order to regain the trust from the travelers. And those protocols must be backed up by the government. And coordination, coordination, and coordination. After September the 11th, we found that there was a lack of coordination. And those were really important moments that had an impact on recovery. But after 2008, the the, the, rec the recovery was much better because it was coordinated by the G8 G20. So right now we are working on providing global lines uh, so that international organizations, also the leader associations in the industry can take the lead in order to design the first protocols. This was done with 11 uh, key uh, co uh, key sectors like uh, airlines, airports, operate, uh, tourist operators, insurance, uh, rental companies, rent a car, uh, convention centers, and now also tourism. And also all of those protocols already implement the World Health Organization latest standards. And as I mentioned, this proceeding required the backing up of the governments. So after we launched these protocols, we called the different governments for them to back up the adoption of these protocols so that they can implement them and reestablish the confidence that is so needed so that the travelers can restart our sector. Exactly. So this is a good starting point uh, to talk about uh, safety, this uh, feeling of safety that we're trying to transmit to restart the industry. I know that the uh, Travel and Tourism Council has launched the uh, Global Safety Seal, um, which will be awarded to destinations that adopt its standards and ensure and protect the health of travelers. Um, tourist destinations will receive the seal of approval if issued by the WTTC, which is supported by the um, World Tourism Organization. Um, this seal, which uh, is, I think is important to uh, clarify, it, is free of charge. And uh, it's important to note there isn't an economic factor behind it, but uh, will be granted once destinations and companies adopt and uh, fully comply with the standardized uh, hygiene, sanitation, and uh, physical distancing protocols um, that you're working on to avoid uh, um, contagious with coronavirus. So I know that you're working very closely uh, about this, so what can you tell about it? I believe that you have 
made a description, a description which is 100% accurate. All of the companies operating in tourism will be able to use this seal, provided that they abide with the with the protocols. And they must also have signed the terms and conditions. The most important is that this seal allows the travelers to recognize the governments and the companies all over the world that has implemented standards all over the world on safety, which has an objective to reinitiate the trust of the travelers and allow them to travel safely. I just forgot to clarify there is no, not the same um, this recommendation or certification, correct? So the WTTC makes recommendations and demands certain uh, health requirements before writing and granting the global safety seal. But the question is who verifies the compliance with this protocol that we're talking about? Well, Basically, it's a self-evaluation. We are not an audit company, we cannot certify, but it is important to point that we decided to only grant this seal to public entities and associations, excuse me for this word, uh, associations, both national and international, so that those associations can have control over who is granted this uh, seal we do not we do not give this seal to private companies unless they belong to us because we do not have the knowledge on whether they have implemented them we also verify the protocols of public entities before we give them the seal just to make sure that their protocols are in line with our protocols and this measure has been very powerful because we have seen many destinations adapting their protocols in order to abide with us. And we also found changes in policies from governments, which is something really important. I've seen it and uh, I'm familiarized with this because I think it's a very important point. But uh, another interesting point that I would like to mention is who will control the actual uh, compliance over time. So because uh, obviously it's going to start it, but uh, and people are going to um, buy um, air tickets for one or two or three, uh, six months. So they feel safe now but who can uh, um, guarantee it over time? And I'm saying this because I understand that uh, the, um, the state is, uh, it's up to the state to control this. For uh, example, here in Europe, it's up to the national accreditation body, so, but there are other countries. So how can travelers feel safe that this is going to uh, be followed? The companies, um and the governments that use this seal have signed the terms and conditions and they will guarantee the continuous abiding both on their on themselves and also on their private sector to which they give this seal this should raise trust on travelers also how to issue certifications, this is something that we are working on right now with organizations which are worldwide known. We are developing also some training for the different modules. For now, we believe that the decision on whether this seal is a certification or not will be decided by the government. Uh, simply remember that this seal reduces the risk, but it will not eliminate the risk of contagion. There are companies that may use, could use this seal without abiding, but most of the times it's companies who really want to adapt themselves to this new normality and that they want to offer their services with a minimum of safety. So it's just, it's a matter of competition because travelers will demand these uh, measures and those companies who do not adapt themselves will not 
will lose uh, part of their business because travelers will demand this. That's right, it's all up to responsibility. We got uh, um, a comment from uh, um, Wolfgang in Germany who is uh, related to this uh, issue. The, the problem is that there are no common rules. Although the virus is the same all over, in Germany the decision goes down to regional health office. What is allowed in uh, uh, North Rhine-Westphalia may be forbidden or more restricted in Berlin. There are no chances for planning touristic operators uh, to have a, a safe basis for, for any um, protocols. So this is what we've been talking about and what is goes in one country, for instance, in Spain, where uh, there is a autonomous region. So this is also another challenge is how to unify, not just uh, on international level, but on a national level. Yes, exactly. And this is why we have started with the private sector in order to make them align their protocols and then achieve the backing up from the governments. I believe that Maribel will tell you about the work that we are going to do with the G7 plus three uh, in order to have further coordination on a global scale. I know that Austria has a similar way uh, of working with, with the lender and my colleague in the ministry told me, well, you want a global coordination, but we are struggling to have a coordination within the country. So this is, this is a challenge. This is a great challenge for the whole political system on a global level because politicians need to understand that uh, uh, they need coordination. So if they need a line where the uh, uh, autonomy uh, exists, but uh, on some uh, supranational questions, they need uh, a general coordination. And obviously this is a, a subject for discussion in the, uh, I know that the tourist sector is uh, interna international, how to lead this to uh, on a political and international level. And I would like to talk about a specific subject. I've been uh, uh, discussing lately uh, in the last few weeks uh, with the politicians in Portugal and uh, we're very, it's very close to Spain. So uh, we're watching the, the situation in Portugal very closely. Um, they are controlling the protocols of businesses and uh, carrying out according to the information that I have some uh, verification on behalf of the state, which is very active um, and it's been from the beginning of the pandemics, but now even more. So what is the, the general attitude of the destination regarding the role of the state in the verification of the implementation of the recommended measures? Well, the way in which a country, a city or a region wants to deal with this situation depends on them. There are many cases like Portugal or the Philippines where the country already has a certification based on their protocols that we already know and their protocols are in line with our own protocols. So they give this seal as something additional uh, to all of the companies that receive the national certification. Other countries like Sri Lanka uh, need an audit before receiving the seal. And there are many other destinations that work more or less like us. It will depend on the people asking for the seal, uh, will sign the terms and conditions and they will issue a self-evaluation. But even within that, there are changes because, for example, the Caribbean Hotel it requires an additional compromise, which is they must attend uh, lessons about safety. Other destinations also have workshops in order to explain how everything works and how they can implement these measures. Or in the case of, of uh, an association in Mexico where they review all of the protocols before giving the seal. So the attitude 
is positive, but it will depend on the context and the local practices. One of course has got to do with the cultural uh, issues as well. And uh, uh, in one of uh, our Wednesday meetings, uh, we um, saw that uh, somebody came back from Greece and uh, um, she shared with us uh, her own personal experience, how uh, it was her first uh, holiday to Greece, and uh, it was a very good uh, commentary comments on uh, um, as, as, a, as, a, as a tourist. So there are examples that we can take, so we can help other people in other parts of the world. So I would like uh, you to comment a little bit about that. When it comes to examples, the best practices of countries, we have the case of Greece, we have the case of Portugal, who they have also worked really well. Right now we are working actively with Spain and Spain has a problem of lack of communication. Uh, we have made a great work, but it could not be seen in other countries. So the problem is not the best practices because all of the countries want, they have always wanted and they are working so that the citizens can travel. The problem has been the lack of coordination, the lack of coordination within Europe, also with Asia, with other countries. Now we have a quarantine here, now we don't have a quarantine there, which has generated a lot of uh, lack of trust that made things to go slower. From the month of July, we thought that everything would be more coordinated, but at the end of the month of August, we found that this situation would go worse because of the lack of coordination. So if we rewind, what we should do and where we are working right now is calling the governments uh, so that there is an international coordination on something as basic as the protocols, what sort of tests to use, how and when to use a quarantine. We don't want general quarantines, uh, which are the measures that are going to be implemented in the private sector. So what we must work now is two different aspects. One, the barriers that we find, and second, how to give trust to the travelers. The rest, which are the best practices? Many, Greece, the Canary Islands, Portugal. So I could spend a whole life speaking about these initiatives. What we must do is learning from the past. We found something similar in the past. This is not the first pandemic. Uh, this is an unprecedented one but in the past we found other pandemics. So in the past we found 90 different crises caused by natural disasters, terrorism, and many other things. So if you think from September the 11th, we are still recovering because we still don't know uh, what to do when we are clearing the security. Uh, from the crisis in 2018, we now know what to do because of the coordination of G20. Let me interrupt you a second. We got on our screen um, for the people that uh, um, listen in English. Uh, the slide is divided for what happened in the past and what is happening uh, in the future. And uh, as we know, the 11th of September was something really important for uh, traveling. It was very difficult uh, the, to coordinate the whole thing. Um, but uh, although many years have gone by, we still uh, have a rather bad uh, protocols because they're so different depending on each airport. And uh, this is something that uh, is seen a lot. There's an example of lack of coordination where the private sector did not intervene is with September the 11th and now uh, the different countries don't know how to act on different airports. Airports, We don't know, do I have to take off my, uh, take off my belt, my shoes? So this shows how important it is to get involved the private sector because they are the ones pointing what is needed. So, 
the importance of the private sectors in this uh, aspect. Uh, if we go see the uh, antecedent of 2000, and eight uh, that was coordinated uh, through the G20, SARS, MERS, etc. And we should be a little bit more uh, optimistic because now we have uh, um, going to have more options, more success in this uh, crisis. For sure, that's for sure. We are now working. You know, we call the different governments. We call G7 plus three three, which are Spain, Australia, and South Korea, which are the 10 biggest countries. And we are asking for a coordinated effort. We are asking them to have coordination on the most important points, like the sort of tests, so that whatever I do here is valid in the USA, or maybe in Asia, or whatever. Also, which protocols, which protocol are going to be passed as international protocols and also so that everyone knows that these seals mean something and which are the measures that we are going to implement so that the private sector can survive and what can we do to help the private sector and these are the messages that we would like to launch but if they cannot coordinate between themselves we will continue working and it will happen the same as on September the 11th. Right now, Spain has asked for support and we are having meetings with the Spanish government that will guarantee that they will carry our messages that hopefully will mean a coordination within the G20. From the very beginning, we have been coordinating with other countries so that the private sector is involved until the very end, which is very important. It has been quite complicated because at the beginning, nobody knew what was happening. Nobody knew anything. But right now, it seems that we are making ourselves heard and we are bringing the government to work with us in trying to reinitiate the trust in this sector and reinitiate the sector. So, uh, as we still have the, the security uh, in the airports because of September the 11th, in the future we will have to implement measures that will last for a long time, but we cannot stop traveling. We cannot stop uh, moving from one place to another. We already talked about this in one of the uh, surveys that we did uh, on the global level, that people really do want to start traveling again, that the biggest fear is not in the being uh, the contagious, is the uh, consequences of uh, traveling and being trapped in a, a compulsory quarantine while they are in a specific place. So people want to start traveling in a safe way with all the hygiene protocols that uh, we all have in a very uh, obvious way. But if, we, if I uh, travel by plane with my family and I'm in a certain place and there is a, a change of politics in the quarantine level, which is what happens in Spain with the United Kingdom, the people that were here in Spain, and when they went back, they had to do the quarantine for 14 days. Uh, so these are the practical issues that uh, governments are dealing with. So when we talk, we talk about the seven plus um, three countries, what are they doing? When uh, do you think there's going to be uh, a global reactivation of the industry? Uh, we are waiting at the moment. Well, in fact, there is a, there's going to be an European meeting, after which there will be the meeting of the G20. We are working so that during these weeks we can advance this uh, agenda. And we will launch some messages because if we 
if we cancel, if we if we have a quarantine, people will not travel because after a vacation, you will not spend 15 additional days at home. It's not only that people cannot go back to their countries. The biggest problem is that you will not be able to go back to work. You will not go back to uh, normal life. You will not take your children to the school if you are coming back from a country which is on a red list. So I know that there are some countries having bilateral meetings so that they can change this situation, uh, so that they can guarantee that people can go from one place to another. It's not the same as in March, where the intensive care units were uh, full uh, and the situation now is different. There's a rise in, in the contagions because there are more tests, but the hospitals are not full. So we cannot measure now as we were measuring in March. Of course, that's an, uh, we have to take the importance of uh, uh, the the whole contest. But uh, um, we've been talking about the uh, um, plane corridors, um, flight corridors um, in all over the world. So maybe that's what you were talking about. Yes, if you have an area like the Canary Islands where the contagion rate is really, really low, why are we going to avoid people from traveling to the Canary Islands where the situation is completely different to the situation in Madrid? So we want to make sure that the information that we are sharing is adequate and we must have those corridors where people can move from one place to another. We cannot consider the, that the whole country has the same situation. We must measure the different points. Uh, and if you make, te if you take tests, one at the beginning, one later on, one uh, when you go back to your to your country, we have not heard of uh, travelers being in Spain who have been uh, who have acquired the virus while in Spain. So contagion is the the most important or is the focus, and the focus is not the amount of people who has not had any contagion while in Spain, because we are only measuring the failure. We are not measuring the success because there's thousands of people who have come and everything has gone well. It's only a few cases, but we are focusing on those focusing. And if we continue focusing in that, we will lose 192 million employments and uh, a big amount of more than two hundred and seventy two uh, dollar uh, billion dollars yeah the translator is saying that uh, it, we're going very fast so we're going to speak a little bit slower i have uh, a few questions or reflections from our chat uh, uh, we don't have a crystal ball, but uh, we got loads of information, so we can kind of predict or have a feeling of what uh, is going to come. So James is asking, how will the COVID-19 pandemic accelerate or redirect the global travel and hospitality industry over the next three or five years? So my, I, I think it is asking, he's asking how the industry will be. So uh, not just how we are going to go back, but uh, on a medium and long term. Well, maybe you want to answer, Chris? Well, I, I, I saw that question from the side of the offer and from the demand. And the offer, it will depend on how long this pandemic lasts and also from the support that is receiving the sector. Uh, and that we, the sector will continue receiving because there are good things. It could be that the industry will redirect to countries where they are receiving support. And it could also happen that the industry will consolidate on big companies if they don't uh, give support to the small companies. And on the side of the demand, it is still early, but the sort of tendency that we can find it seems evident that a lot of people will look for safety and hygiene. 
and there's this Z generation and the millennials who already had this impression that something was broken in our world and that together with this pandemic has reforced their point of view. So uh, what about all these uh, destinations linked to nature? So the uh, natural products is very strong. So it's talking about the potential developments in this kind of destination, which are not the traditional ones. So destiny where uh, nature is going to be Destination with the nature is very important because people are going to uh, look for um, safer destinations, destinations linked um, with nature. Um, but some people say that uh, uh, after COVID, they will have uh, opportunities. I'm talking about uh, countries such as Africa, um, Latin America, uh, where they have uh, a huge uh, offer of uh, uh, nature tourism. Yeah, those countries will have a lot of possibilities, but again, it will depend on on the length of these pandemics because uh, our memory is quite short. It will also depend on the work that they are doing now. Now it's the time to start uh, working in order to create these products, these experiences that correspond with the new normality in tourism. Another of the uh, questions that we have, uh, um, Wolfgang says, I fully agree with the necessity of a worldwide protocol. And he's asking, are you in contact with the EU? Um, because this uh, initiative should be coordinated bottom down. And uh, I know that uh, you are uh, trying to do this. So what, uh, what, is, what is the time frame? You mentioned the uh, uh, G7 uh, meeting, the G20, so the political agenda. How is it going to be? Yeah, there is an agenda. Uh, uh, the late, in late September, there will be a meeting. Also in October, there will be a meeting of G20. And we are right now working in line with those with that agenda. But we have done all our work at a private uh, sector, at, at a private level. We are liaising with them. And this is something that is needed. The, the time has come where we cannot continue expecting for solutions uh, from health solutions. We must implement protocols and we must uh, implement this coordination on a European level. We have a close relationship with the European Union, but also great part of our members belong to Europe and we are working on different sides working on with organizations, companies at a local level, the different countries. We not only have meetings on a global scale, but we also have over 100 meetings with governments of different countries where we are giving them feedback and we have prepared uh, the points that we must keep in mind in order to travel. The agenda, I think that in October, we have a clear idea. So you're expecting by the end of the year a standardization process. So uh, this is maybe a possible scenario. And I'm saying this because yesterday, when we're talking about health uh, uh, subjects, it was uh, very um, impacting to know that the uh, Ox Oxford um, vaccine was uh, stopped because of uh, a, a reaction, a negative reaction in one of the uh, um, volunteers. And uh, obviously um, we thought that we were gonna have uh, this uh, vaccination in, uh, in place by the end of this year. There are many vaccines and there's a lot of people working on different vaccines. Never before so many people were working with just one uh, objective. And we must guarantee some protocols before the vaccine so that once the vaccine exists, we still have a sector because we can start implementing the vaccine in the first quarter next year. 
but until everybody has been vaccinated, it will take a long time. So, and, and, and something new, new illnesses may arise also. Of course, the HWO says the virus uh, eradication will take uh, more than a year and a half. So we really have to work because uh, nobody can cope with this situation for a very long time. But talking about destinations again, uh, just to come to the conclusions, is that uh, destinations should not wait uh, for the coronavirus uh, to uh, take, take over. The uh, uh, health situation should be uh, planned and invol involucrate the uh, business people and also uh, involucrate um, people, citizens. They should, uh, they should be fundamental for the recovery and when the time comes obviously uh, execute all the actions of uh, the plan that uh, we've been talking about so this new strategy uh, can non will not only be or cannot be just a marketing strategy but uh, we also have to um, but we have to be reconfigure the offer of this de de destination in the light of the new reality of, of coronavirus and, uh, as we mentioned, providing safety and confidence to travelers. So I would like some uh, uh, final recommendations on this uh, issue. Those who work now in order to adopt their products, uh, who are taking training, who are analyzing their clients, who are analyzing the markets, the way of approaching them, those destinations will, will be the most competitive because competition will not only depend on one factor, but on many. So let's not lose this opportunity to review our markets so that in the future we will be there offering something that will be demanded and we already know what will be demanded and maybe christopher can say it better there will be areas like digitalization like environment uh, environment they will be really important to be implemented and to work on them So we go back to Chris. Uh, there's a question for you, Maribel. How did uh, technology affect the uh, tourism t sector after this pandemic? Will job description change in the next uh, uh, few years? We uh, talked about this a lot, but uh, if the uh, destination sectors will have to incorporate loads of uh, technology and obviously artificial intelligence is something that uh, the, the businesses need to be uh, talking about. Well, we have a lot of work on our web page. We have uh, a lot of bibliography. The future of employment is one of the areas where we were working. We will review that because everything has changed. Digitalization as sustainability has been boosted. It was a need, but now it has been boosted. Everything that has to be with touchless, with technology, will make things easier because uh, we will be able to travel from one side to another, having everything on your on your smartphone. These changes, we are already working on them. And one of the points that we consider to be really important is which apps are we going to use, which formats we are going to use, how we will work on safety on the information. But the future of employment is going to change. But uh, it was going to change before also because uh, from time to time, everything changes and some works will disappear because new work jobs will appear also. Yes, for your information, uh, we are going to have another webinar on the 1st of October on how the um, workers uh, training 
will have to change the training of the people that want to uh, work in the tourism se sector now. And this is uh, really important because uh, they need to have uh, new skills, they need to learn, and uh, there's going to be many changes on a corporate level. So it's something that we'll discuss in our next uh, meeting. And uh, the other question is, uh, which Latin American countries have adopted the uh, WTTC uh, uh, seal? Yeah, I think that Adolfo sent over the chat a link. Uh, uh, Aruba, uh, Jamaica, uh, Grenada, Trinidad and Tobago, uh, other countries and destinations in Brazil, Canada, Mexico. And we are about to close the, pro the process with Peru and Paraguay and several other destinations, but you can find them in the link. So, as I can see, there's a global response, and this is really good. So, one uh, final word, uh, Chris, to just finalize our meeting today. Sorry about that. I, I was saying thank you again for this opportunity to share with you our experiences. And we will continue with this work, which is interesting and very important. And we are evolving uh, whenever new needs arise, just to make sure that the protocols continue. And we will see whether we can develop a training program, a uh, certification program also. So fantastic. So we have uh, come to the conclusion of our uh, seminar today. So I would like to thank you for your participation. I know that you are very busy and it's been an honor for us to, uh, for you to give us uh, your time and to share um, and to put forward your information through this webinar. We hope that uh, uh, the our industry can resume all the, the traveling and that uh, uh, the industry can be revived as soon as possible. We look forward to seeing you in uh, our next webinar. So thank you, Maribel and uh, Chris. Uh, thank you for your fantastic work and thank you for working with Sky International. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.